I am excited about this day. We've waited a long time for this to unfold. There's a couple of introductions. You contemplative nine o'clock people might not know how expansive our children's program is becoming and is. And some of you might not know Lori Massengill. Lori, can you stand up? This is our, our lead. She takes care of, uh, yeah. We are so grateful to you. She has such the heart of the mother and heart for the child. And bridging that with what we have for you today is just a true opportunity for you to expand your heart into the world of a child, um, any child that you meet. I was especially happy to see Lori Rizzi here. She has the heart of a, uh, of a grandmother, but I've also seen her in the courthouse. She works there, and I've seen her with uh, children to make them feel safe, to engage with them in such a way that they forgot that their world was falling apart. She takes them by the hand and shows them a new way. And so I, I look at that mo role model. I had my own children, but they were mine, and they're perfect. Other children, I'm like, Oop, I don't know you. I don't know how to, how to talk to you. So I am so thrilled with our speakers today, their wisdom and their way, but I also have to introduce you, Tim. Tim Riley, he has gifted this to our center. He has allowed these two wonderful people that he met many years ago that transformed his life with his child. Our children, one or two? Two, five, many children. Oh dear, is this gonna be one of those fertility things as well? <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Tim, for your generous donation. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. So that being said, um, who am I talking about? I'm talking about the Lovemores. Their books are phenomenal, and their beautiful smiles and their wit and their way and their sincerity of truth is something that you're about to witness here. They have a natural learning relationship with the child, and they recognize that this is an, able to restore the authenticity to parenting and teaching. Indeed, natural learning relationship is inspired by the greatness in each of us. Today, we're gonna hear from two of the frontline workers in this field of family dynamics and child development. Ba Lovemore and Josette Lovemore have revealed so many of our family learning partners have intuited for years so many of the information that some of you, I kind of knew that. They've grasped that, they've been able to articulate that, share that, grow that, and focus on the optimal health and well-being is what is the most valuable focus upon the child and that's what's most important. So in today's talk, Lean back into yourself and listen with an open heart and new ears. Our children are our future. I know you've heard that a lot. Indeed, it is our future. May we find a way to be the agents of change in our relationships with our children. So I honor you both so much for your travel, for your way, for working with our teachers for these last few months. So God bless you very much. And everyone, welcome the Lovemores. Wow, my heart's going. I not, I've spoken in many places, but what introductions and what a beautiful reading. But to hear one's words like that, my goodness, whoa. Well, as you can imagine, Josette and I are so glad to be here. And I won't take the time now to give you all our background, all that sort of thing, but feel free to Google us or we're all over the place. We've been around for a long time. And Lori, is Lori here now or she'll be here later? Oh, hey, Lori, you've just been amazing. <laughs> amazing. And Reverend Sue, thank you for the kind words and um, for hosting us. And of course, Tim and Arlene and the Tim Riley Family Foundation. Give them another round of applause. Uh, 
And we thank them and all of you for recognizing that there is a spiritual essence expressed in, through, and as nature that is in each of us and expresses itself in the natural development of children. Josette will tell us a little bit about natural learning relationships in a minute, but first I want to frame our work a little bit more with the help of my understanding of some of Ernest Holmes' uh, work. Holmes had much to say about nature and natural laws. He said, the road to freedom lies not through mysteries or occult performances, but through the intelligent use of nature's forces and laws. Then he went on to say that nature operates through a natural, uh, through a law of logical sequence. Well, what are the natural laws that operate through children and what is their natural sequence? That's a question that of course naturally follows. Perhaps the most obvious law of nature and logical sequence is the unfolding of life stages in every form of life. And of course, we as humans unfold in life stages as well. Every culture and society has recognized this and tried somehow to incorporate it into their approach to children. But in general, child development so far and human development has reflected more the cultural values than actually the natural laws and understandings as they operate through children. It is through the understanding of consciousness, it is how consciousness unfolds in us by which we can understand the natural laws. We can't understand them just by following this or that behavior or this or that attitude because those are so shaped by the given culture. But naturally, who we are, our essence, in our consciousness. That's where the natural laws can most clearly be seen and by connecting there, we create a leverage point. We actually interact with children so that all of their great natural capacities can unfold. You can do all sorts of things. You can correct speech, you can teach cognitive development, you can do all these sorts of things. But all you're doing is kind of fixing a part here and fixing a part there. And that's what child development has been till now in the West. You have emotional development and social development and physical development. But we don't grow in segments, do we? We grow as whole people all the time. And at the core, at the essence, is our consciousness. Our consciousness, our field of knowing, without which Holmes said, nothing can be known. The only real thing, Holmes says, is consciousness. And I, for one, know that to be true also. So if we're going to be with children, be with our life essence, be with the unfolding of our humanity, we have to be in consciousness with children. We have to understand how the natural laws unfold in a consciousness way. And as I said, Josette will have a lot more to say about that in a minute. So I want to also just say one more thing because time is, I mean, Josette and I could talk for days, and we do, <laughs> on this sort of thing. And we've had such a great time with the teachers here. And one of the things I'm hoping to do is to energize all of you and hope you all energize other congregants to recognize how important the children's program is and how the future here is in large measure, not just in humanity, but right here is in large measure by how those children are connected to, seen, and, and related to throughout. But before we go into that little bit of what Josette can share with us, I want to say something about how knowing and engaging the whole of our children, what it means to us as parents, as teachers, as devotees to the greatness in life that is in each of us. Holmes referred to Gandhi when he said, quote, it appeared it didn't matter if he spoke or not, as the audience gradually merged into the influence of his presence or whatever he may call it. By the way, in the East, this is long recognized as darshan. 
we have a relationship right now, right here. There's a wholeness that's, that's available, that's here. And in that relationship, my words, what are they unless how they live in you and how they come back? And that flow, that relationship, that essence, that spiritual quality that is in relationship. So if it's important between the consciousness of the audience and the speaker in this case, how does it work with a parent or a grandparent or anyone interacting with a child or a teacher? That is such an intimate and for a child, it's, such a, it's almost a universal event. It's the wholeness of their moment. Who are we as we enter into that? Are we participating consciousness to consciousness? Are we understand, not just thinking about it, not objectifying outside of ourselves. Oh, there's the kid over there. Let me fill them up. But how is the unfolding? What are the natural laws for them and for us? that we can be and recognize this flow that we have together. That's at the heart of what's available to us. So, without more, Gilbert, rock and roll. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Um, a little bit electronically challenged, but I got good instructions. Okay, there we go. All right. So, one of the things that Ba and I have done in our career is to um, try and make child development, human development, very accessible. Not foreign, not academic, not a language that is a little bit too bound up into terms that we don't all understand. We want to make it very, very accessible, and that's what I hope to do this morning. So what I'd like to do is start with a quote from Holmes and then build out from that. The principle of any science, says Holmes, is invisible, as is the idea of spirit, invisible. No one has actually seen God. No one has actually seen life. What we have seen are the manifestations of life. No one has seen intelligence. We've experienced it. The mathematician solves a problem, but the problem is not the principle of mathematics. The solution of the problem is an effect or a result of the application of the principle. We do not see life. We are experiencing living. That's from Holmes. So, Following that, we can easily say, spirit itself is unseen, yet it is experienced. The principles that comprise the natural laws of human development are not always visible. So, yet we experience their application every day in our interactions with children in everyday life. So I'd like to give you some information here that will contribute to making that a better holistic experience. Natural learning relationships. Natural is that which we're born with. Learning is that which we acquire during life. And the relationships we have with children and the children have with us activates their natural capacities so that they can learn in each age and stage of life. It's a developmental science. And as a science, we can understand that these capacities we're born with, they're innate. We all have them. But we need the right environment to make those act, uh, natural capacities accessible to us. Children in every age of childhood need the appropriate environment so that they can access their natural capacities, that which they're born with. In child development, we have some basic premises. Capacities are innate, which I just said. But development depends upon relationship. 
our relationships with our children and with everybody else's children, all the children are our children. Our relationships with children are creating the environment that allows that child to touch their natural capacities. So these inherent capacities are developing through every age and stage of childhood, but different capacities are available at different ages. And I'm gonna make that a little more explicit here this morning. So every age of childhood and every age of development, something different is organizing. And I can cross correlate this with brain science and all kinds of things, but time permitting, I'm just gonna stick with development. The organizing principle at each age of childhood, let me talk about that for a second. It can't be seen. You can't see what's organizing except in how it manifests. What you see is behavior. What you see is the child's interests. What you see is the child's enthusiasm for life, the development of trust. These are the kinds of things that you see. So the organizing principle is an immaterial essence. It's a life force energy that is moving the child. It's an animating principle, an actual, actuating cause of an individual life. Its expression changes with each age of childhood, with each stage of development, while integrating all previous stages. So every stage we go through gets integrated and something new emerges that allows us to access a new inner capacity. And the organizing principle is always inexorably moving toward accessing and actualizing well-being. So let me talk about the organizing principle in each age of childhood and make this very down to earth and practical. This is law conformable. In other words, development, human development is a natural law. We're all unfolding in stages. The variable is the environment. And what is the child exposed to in the environment? And that's where we come into play because we're, we are the environment of the children around us. We create it, we organize it, we organize our time and our space and our relationships to them. But what's organizing in the child? From, and we've been talking about this with the teachers, with Lori here at the church. So from the first beginning of life, through age seven, what's primarily organizing in the child is a sense of rightful place, a sense of belonging. Where do I belong? Who do I belong with? It refers to a sense of joy and strength in the experiencing the body as connected to the whole, as connected to you. A child needs, all humans actually, need a sense of place in the world and it is from that sense of place that all future learning occurs. I have to know my place, I have to feel secure in my place, and then all future learning occurs. From moving forward in development from about the age of 8 through 12, there organizes, different part of the brain comes into play, organizes a sense of trust a sense of relationship with others, I and other in relationship, and how do I trust? A feeling sense emerges, and the synergy of respect and community really becomes very, very important. And admiration and care for the family within a community impacts this age tremendously, and trust grows. So creating an environment that allows the child to access a sense of inner trust and trust of you, trust of others, grows the community. From 13 through 18, a sense of autonomy. The individuation process occurs. And as agents, we can manifest and actualize the spiritual laws of creating. And intense idealistic affection comes into play in the teen years. We always think of teenagers as a little bit of a problem. We never think of them as intense, idealistic affection is available in these teen years when we create the right environments and when they can access their innate capacity to organize a sense of healthy autonomy. From 
18 through 23, and yeah, childhood goes through 23 years. We human beings have very complex brains, a very complex system, and we need all 23 years to access a sense of interconnectedness, the full realization of our wholeness, not only with the natural world, but as an essence of our own spiritual nature. We are that spirit. And it is in those 18 to 23 years that the child can come into a blossoming of the um, self-knowledge that that is who we are. Love of all developmental organizing principles is available to this age individual. So that gives you a bit of a taste what's organizing through all of those developmental years. And each of those things, each of those organizing principles requires something different from us in relationship, in the way we speak to them, in the language we use, in the environments we create. We were just walking through the environments of the classrooms yesterday, giving suggestions and ideas about how to make this their space so that they feel welcome and whole within it and feel that they, can, they are um, able to access their wholeness no matter which age they are. So if you think about it, the first developmental stage, body awareness, body being, I am the center of my world. To the second developmental stage, myself and other, I and other, is, oops, it's a we. It's a community and a we. To the third developmental stage, teen, autonomy, organizing healthy self-autonomy, it's I to the third, fourth developmental stage, reasonableness, is the organization of a global perspective. I and a global perspective, I and other. So I, we, I, and other. And work for the common good. And that's the age where a child starts to look for a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning in life, and to really organize all former development to accessing and creating and expressing and giving back. So in this natural learning relationships, though, it includes the whole family. You can imagine that an adult who puts themselves in a position to provide and create and really consider this, you're gonna change in the process. We don't get to stay the same. When we're in relationships with children, we are also changing with them. And that, if you want to know more about that, you can look at Grow Together. However, the good news is that this grant that has been given to the community here provides for upcoming classes for all families and anybody who wants to participate, and it'll take place on the internet, so you can do it from the comfort of your home. And there are flyers for that. Where are they, Lori? In the back? In the back, there's flyers for that. And so there's Saturday classes, four of them, hour and a half, mere hour and a half of your time, four Saturday classes, and we'll go through this in a lot more detail. And that's available as granted by the Riley Foundation, so it's a really beautiful gift. So I want to give the microphone back to Ba for concluding remarks, and thank you all. Well, I know that's just a brief, brief look at consciousness, and I can't encourage you enough to take advantage of this wonderful gift. Um, and we can all meet on Zoom. Our first four weeks with the teachers here was on Zoom, and I think we all found it very successful. So natural, the NLR, Natural Learning Relationships, centers on the consciousness of the child and in so doing, provides practical, understandable insight into the child's consciousness and easily applicable approaches to every aspect of life with children. Just gonna have to take my word for it, but in all our years of working with so many, we've had our own learning centers, our own schools, we've probably worked with hundreds of schools, as well as, gosh, so many, so many families. When you really participate, like through the four-week class, you really get, oh, it's not that hard. It's really not that hard. So, in fact, I'm, I'm going off topic here a second. So, when you talk about supporting the environment, 
how do we feed our children? We're starting to think much more about, hey, what diet works for that child? There's many ways to give them protein, but how they have to have protein. Well, that young, young child needs their rightful place honored. What are the nourishments? What is the environment? And you can think about it the same way you think about diet. That's some of what we'll go through on the class. Our consciousness, as Holmes said, our consciousness and awareness constitutes the only absolute solid soul, soul evidence of being there is. Because if you would take away consciousness, there would be nothing left. So we can move away from the hurtful conditioning imposed on children. Holmes warned that practically the whole human race is hypnotized because somebody else told it how to think. In other words, we're not coming from our natural selves, in the natural laws, being to being. So natural learning relationships, Sue, you hit it on the, on the, on the head, it's like, it's, we're not saying anything new, we're articulating a natural law that's been in us, and Holmes, and you probably all know the quote where he makes an analogy to electricity. Electricity's always been there, till somebody uncovered, oh, there it is. And then we don't say it's not natural, it is very much natural. In the same way, natural learning relationships has always been there. It's time for us as a culture, it's time for us to move forward and step into that essence. And I want to conclude with a teaching story from the Persian tradition. And this is, anybody ever hear of Mullah Nasruddin? Ah, bravo. So there's a, he's a wise fool in the old Persian tradition. And the mullah, and every year in his home uh, community, or actually in the country, the king has to give a parade. And if you catch the king's eye, the king has to grant you a boon. So mullah, in a typical way, during the parade, runs right up to the king, looks him in the eye, and the king goes, oh my gosh, okay, Mullah, well, what do you want? And Mullah says, 50,000 gold pieces. And the king says, Mullah, that's quite a lot. You're a religious man, ask God. And Mullah says, I did, and he said to ask you. <laughs> and I'm putting it back at you, friends. I'm saying, it's us. We're it, Holmes knew it. Every spiritual philosophy I've studied, and I've studied many, says the same thing over and over. The actualization of wholeness, the actualization of spirit, is lived through us, through the life force, and through consciousness. And if we start relating to children in that way, then we have this great opportunity to allow a transformation to emerge and unfold according to natural laws, just like the flowers in your garden, the food in the, in, the, in the vegetable gardens. I could go on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, we're done. Thank you.